In 1901, a young philosopher and mathematician named Bertrand Russell sits at his desk deep in thought. What begins as a routine exploration of mathematical foundations is about to become something far more consequential. By dawn, Russell will uncover a logical time bomb, a paradox so fundamental that it threatens to collapse the very foundations of mathematics and all of science. What is a number, really? Not the symbol four scribbled on paper or four apples sitting in a basket, but the abstract concept of four itself. This deceptively simple question would lead to one of the greatest intellectual crises in the history of mathematics. The story begins with Immanuel Kant, the influential 18th century Prussian philosopher. Kant had argued that mathematics was essentially a construction of the human mind, subjective in a sense. This conclusion deeply troubled later philosophers like Gottlob Frege and Bertrand Russell. Mathematics can't be subjective, they insisted. It must be objective, the bedrock of scientific certainty. To counter Kant's view, they developed a position called logicism. According to logicism, mathematics wasn't just some mental construction. It was a branch of logic itself. They believed that arithmetic, the most basic type of mathematics, could be reduced to first-order logic and set theory. If they succeeded, they would answer that nagging question, what is a number? Their proposed answer, numbers are sets. To understand Russell's paradox, we first need to understand sets. Set theory was developed in the 1870s by Georg Cantor, a Russian-German mathematician. Using set theory, Cantor proves something utterly mind-bending. Some infinities are larger than others. Yes, you can have an infinite collection of one thing and an infinite collection of another thing, yet have more of one than the other. So what exactly is a set? A set is simply a collection of objects. Let me walk you through the basics, the straightforward version that can be formulated in ordinary English language. Imagine three markers sitting on a table. The set of these markers contains three items. But here's what makes sets so powerful. The objects in a set don't need to be physically collected together to form a set. We could talk about the set of all people watching this video right now, scattered across the globe. Even more interestingly, the objects in a set don't need to be related to each other in any meaningful way. We could create a set containing both LeBron James, the four-time NBA champion, and the top half of the Eiffel Tower. These things have absolutely nothing to do with each other. Yet in set theory, they can peacefully coexist in a single set. Sets can include literally anything we can refer to, even fictional characters. The set containing both LeBron James and Harry Potter is perfectly legitimate in set theory, despite one being a real NBA champion and the other a fictional wizard boy. Sets can even include objects that cannot be imagined. The set of all objects that cannot be imagined is itself a set, potentially containing an infinite number of things. When mathematicians write about sets, they use curly braces, curly brackets. Everything inside these brackets represents what's in the set. So, LeBron James, four, is the set containing a basketball player and the number four. For larger sets, like the set of all cats, we use set builder notation. X, X is a cat. Read as the set of all X, such that X is a cat. Now, let's explore the rules that govern sets. These rules might seem obvious, but they're going to lead us straight into Russell's paradox. Rule one, unrestricted composition. We can make any set we want. Any collection of objects, no matter how random or bizarre, can form a set. Rule two, set identity is determined by membership. What makes a set the specific set that it is? Simply what's inside it. Nothing else matters. Not how we label it, not how we describe it. Rule three, order doesn't matter. The set one, two is exactly the same set as two, one. Rule four, repeats don't change anything. The set one, two, two is identical to the set one, two. Adding the same element multiple times doesn't create a new set. Rule five, description doesn't matter. The set containing LeBron James is identical to the set containing the NBA all-time scoring leader, playoffs included. Same person, same set. Rule six, the union of sets is a set. If you combine two sets, like the set of all cats and the set of all dogs, you get another valid set, the set of all cats and dogs. Rule seven, any subset is a set. If you take some members of a set, they form another valid set. Rule eight, a set can have just one member. The set, LeBron James, is a set with one member called a singleton set. Importantly, this set is not the same as LeBron James himself. LeBron James has won NBA championships. The set containing him has never played basketball. 
Rule 9. A set can have no members. The empty set, sometimes shown as curly braces with nothing inside them, or as a zero with a line through it. So far, so good, but now we approach the rules that will lead us into trouble. Rule 10. Sets can contain sets. We can have sets of sets. For example, the set of all singleton sets includes sets like LeBron James and 17, but it does not contain LeBron James or the number 17 directly. Rule 11. Sets can contain themselves. This is where things get strange. Some sets can be members of themselves. This last rule might seem odd, but it follows naturally from the others. If we can create any set, rule 1, and sets can contain sets, rule 10, then logically, some sets should be able to contain themselves. Let's think about some examples. Does the set of all cats contain itself? No, because that set is not itself a cat. It's a set. Everything in the set of all cats is a cat, and since the set itself isn't a cat, it doesn't contain itself. What about the set of all sets? Does that set contain itself? Yes, the set of all sets contains all sets, and since it is itself a set, it must contain itself. Or consider the set of all things I'm thinking about right now. If I'm currently thinking about that very set, then it contains itself. Following Russell's thought process in 1901, let's consider all the sets that do not contain themselves. The singleton set, LeBron James, doesn't contain itself because it only contains LeBron, not any sets. The set of all cats doesn't contain itself because it's not a cat. The set of all singleton sets doesn't contain itself because it has many members, not just one. So it's not a singleton set. Now let's consider sets that do contain themselves. The set of all sets clearly contains itself. The set of all non-singleton sets contains itself because it has many members, making it a non-singleton set. The set of all sets that have been mentioned in this room, once I mention this set, it contains itself. Here's where Russell's insight occurs. He thought, let's collect all the sets that do not contain themselves and make a new set out of them. We'd write this as, X or X is a set that does not contain itself. The set of all sets that do not contain themselves. Now comes the devastating question Russell posed in his famous letter to Frags on June 16, 1902. Does this set contain itself? Let's work through both possibilities. Possibility 1. The set contains itself. If this set does contain itself, then it would be a member of the set of all sets that do not contain themselves. But wait, the only sets in this collection are those that don't contain themselves. So if our set contains itself, it must not contain itself. That's a contradiction. Possibility 2. The set does not contain itself. If this set doesn't contain itself, then it meets the criterion for membership in the set of all sets that do not contain themselves. That means it should be in the set, which means it contains itself. Another contradiction. Either way, we reach an absurd conclusion. If it contains itself, then it doesn't. If it doesn't, then it does. This is Russell's paradox. And when Frege received Russell's letter explaining it, the paradox devastated him. Frege had just completed the second volume of his life's work, using set theory to derive all of mathematics from pure logic. Russell's paradox revealed a fatal flaw in his system. You might think, well, that's no problem. Set theory is just some made-up rules, right? We can just change the rules. That's exactly what Russell and other mathematicians tried to do. Russell developed his theory of types, and others created systems like zermelo frankel set theory, both of which restrict Rule 11. Sets can no longer contain themselves. These systems also had to modify Rule 1, no longer allowing unrestricted composition of sets. But here's the crucial question. Were we just making up the rules of set theory all along? Can we simply change them when we discover a problem? The unsettling truth is that the rules of set theory aren't merely invented. They reflect how we naturally think about collections of things. And Russell's paradox has an analog in ordinary language that's equally troubling. Let's shift from talking about sets to talking about predicates. In linguistics, a predicate is simply what we say about a subject. In Garfield is a cat. Garfield is the subject. And is a cat is the predicate. We can say that the predicate is a cat is true of Garfield. Just as sets contain objects, predicates are true of subjects. And just as we have rules for sets, we have corresponding rules for how predicates work in natural language. 1. There can be a predicate for any imaginable characteristic of a thing. Anything you can say about something, there's a predicate for that. 2. We can predicate things of predicates. For example, is a cat sounds funny, is a sentence where we're predicating something, sounds funny, of a predicate, is a cat. 3. Predicates can be true of themselves. Is a predicate is true of itself, 
Is a predicate is indeed a predicate, but some predicates are not true of themselves. Is a cat is not a cat, so that predicate is not true of itself. Now, let's try to create a predicate that is true of all predicates that are not true of themselves. This predicate would be, is not true of itself. The crucial question, is this predicate true of itself? If it is true of itself, then it's not true of itself, because that's what it says about itself. If it's not true of itself, then it is true of itself, because it meets its own criterion. This is Russell's paradox in the realm of language and thought. And unlike with set theory, we can't just change the rules here. Predicates demonstrably can be true of themselves in natural language. Let's look at some concrete examples of predicates that are not true of themselves. Is a cat is not a cat? It's a predicate. Dunks doesn't dunk. Predicates can't play basketball. Tastes like chicken doesn't taste like anything. It's a predicate. And here are some predicates that are true of themselves. Is a predicate is a predicate. Is a string of words is a string of words. Typically comes at the end of a sentence. Typically comes at the end of a sentence. Now, let's create a predicate that is true of all the predicates that are true of themselves. That predicate would be, is true of itself. But what about a predicate that is true of all predicates that are not true of themselves? That would be, is not true of itself. Now we face the same question. Is, is not true of itself true of itself? If it is true of itself, then what does it say about itself? It says that it's not true of itself. So if it is true of itself, then it's not true of itself. If it's not true of itself, then it meets its own criterion, which means it is true of itself. If it is, then it isn't. If it isn't, then it is. It's both true and false of itself, a contradiction. And unlike the paradox in set theory, we can't escape this by declaring that predicates cannot be true of themselves. We've already seen clear examples where predicates are true of themselves. This is a paradox embedded in the very structure of our language and thought. What makes Russell's paradox so profound is that it isn't just a quirk of some arbitrary mathematical system. It reveals something essential about how we think and how we use language. When Russell wrote his letter to Frege in 1902, he wasn't just pointing out a technical issue in set theory. He was uncovering a limitation in our very ability to categorize and describe the world consistently. Consider how often we use self-reference in everyday thinking. We have thoughts about our thoughts. We make plans about our planning process. We create categories that might include themselves. The paradox lurks in any system powerful enough to reference itself. And that includes our minds and our language. In mathematics, we might restrict self-reference to avoid the paradox, but we can't eliminate it from our thinking without losing something essential about what makes us human, our ability to reflect on ourselves. Perhaps the most profound lesson of Russell's paradox is not that we need to solve it once and for all, but that we need to recognize and respect the boundaries it reveals. Just as physical laws constrain what's possible in the physical world, logical paradoxes like Russell's constrain what's possible in the realm of consistent thought. This doesn't mean we should abandon the pursuit of knowledge or certainty, but it does suggest a certain intellectual humility, an awareness that even our most powerful tools for understanding the world have their limits. As Russell himself wrote years after his discovery, a logical theory may be tested by its capacity for dealing with puzzles, and it is a wholesome plan, in thinking about logic, to stock the mind with as many puzzles as possible, since these serve much the same purpose as is served by experiments in physical science. In that spirit, Perhaps we can see Russell's paradox not as a dead end but as a signpost, marking a boundary where our logical systems meet their limits and inviting us to explore what lies beyond. The paradox that once threatened to undermine the foundations of mathematics has ultimately enriched our understanding of logic, language, and the nature of human reasoning itself, a reminder that sometimes the most profound insights come from confronting contradictions rather than avoiding them.